program to welcome author Michael Dodds. Michael has written a wonderful book that has been well received called King Richard. He is also a journalist uh, formerly with the Washington Post and he has taught at the University of Michigan, Princeton and Georgetown. Um, he is going to speak to us this evening for uh, a little bit about his book and we will answer questions um, later in the book, excuse me, later in the program. I do want to alert you to the fact that this coming Thursday, we have another author, Robert Giles, and he has written a book called When Truth Matters about the May 4th incident at Kent State. And on Monday, June 7th, we have uh, the book Kindred. And on June 10th, we have Tony Obadicio, who is the author of the book In the Wee Small Hours, um, his conversations with Frank Sinatra. But I want to return tonight to tonight's program and to author Michael Dodds, Dobbs, excuse me, Michael, who's going to talk to us about his book, King Richard, Richard Nixon, the 37th president and the incidents of Watergate. So Michael, what can you tell us about King Richard? Well, thank you very much. Um, for those of you who haven't uh, seen it, this is uh, a copy of my book, which came out uh, last week. Its full title is King Richard, Nixon and Watergate, an American Tragedy. And it has, as you can see, a rather dark uh, picture of Richard Nixon on the front cover. Um, I'm going to explain in a little bit um, the structure of the book, why I chose to call it uh, King Richard. Um, but first of all, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself and why I chose to write this book, um, which is usually the first question that is aimed at authors. Why did you write the book? Um, as you can tell from my accent, um, I'm originally from the UK, uh, but I'm now living in the US. I worked for a long time for the Washington Post for 25 years. Um, and when I was a kid, I, I don't know if this is typical of everyone, but um, for me, I used to take these train rides around the UK and it would go through suburbs past towns and villages, and often the uh, houses were very close to the railway. And I used to look inside the people's houses that the train went past. And I was so curious about, you know, what was going on inside these houses? Um, what were the conversations around the dinner table or the lunch table? Were people arguing with each other? What were the family dynamics inside these anonymous houses. Um, so perhaps it's not surprising that I became a reporter uh, as a profession, because it's a profession that allows you to exercise uh, your insatiable curiosity and uh, to pry into other people's lives. And um, I started covering, you know, big political events. I was uh, sent by the Washington Post uh, uh, as a foreign correspondent, first to uh, Poland in the middle of the, um, you know, the whole collapse of communism, actually. And then later on, I went to Russia. And when I arrived in Russia, the whole system was in the process of uh, collapsing and unraveling. Um, so I wrote, I was a witness to that, to a witness to the collapse of communism. But I understood uh, when I was a reporter, that there was a lot that I didn't know that was going on behind closed doors. Um, so I was very, again, uh, you know, curious to know what was really happening in the Kremlin, uh, as opposed to the part of politics that uh, Russian Soviet politicians uh, chose to reveal of themselves. And uh, it's sometimes said that journalism is the first rough draft of history. But I wanted to, um, particularly when I left Russia, I wanted to find out all the things that uh, I hadn't understood or known about when I was a reporter uh, in Moscow. And um, so I wrote a book called Down With Big Brother, which is a narrative history, really, of the collapse of communism, which I was able to include because of the uh, 
release of uh, Kremlin documents and interviews with uh, participants in these events, I was able to describe, you know, what was happening behind all these closed doors that uh, I was unable to uh, penetrate as a reporter. So I always felt like a kind of little boy trying to, you know, with my uh, uh, nose pressed to the glass, trying to figure out what's going on inside places that I've really got no right to be. And, um, you know, first the Kremlin and then later here in Washington, the White House. Um, and um, so this gets me to the subject of why I chose to write this book about Nixon and Watergate uh, in uh, particularly uh, as his presidency be begins to unravel uh, at the beginning of 1973. Um, and the answer is that, you know, we'll never get as rich a uh, archival resource uh, or we'll never get as close to any American president as we were able to get, or as we are able to get to the 37th president, uh, Richard Nixon, particularly at this very crucial time of his political career, as he was facing the gravest political crisis imaginable, an ex existential crisis for him that ended up with his own resignation. Uh, as you all know, no doubt, you know, Nixon, uh, taped himself, and other presidents had taped themselves before Nixon, um, but they all controlled the recording. They turned it off and turned it on when they wanted to um, record something. With Nixon, he was, among other characteristics, he was rather ham-fisted with technology, and nobody would trust him, and he wouldn't trust himself to turn on the, ra the recording equipment when he wanted to turn it on. So they invented a system that the recording uh, devices would turn on automatically whenever Nixon went into a room or picked up a telephone. So that means that we've got, you know, much more recordings of Nixon than any other president. I mean, I think with LBJ, there's about seven, 700 hours of LBJ's um, telephone conversations. With Nixon, there's nearly 4,000 4, hours of tape recordings, not just of his telephone conversations, but he had um, microphones planted in the Oval Office, the cabinet room up in Camp David, uh, and then on telephone telephones, including the most private room in the White House, where he liked to retire at the end of the day, his favorite room in the White House, actually, was the Lincoln sitting room. Um, so, and at the end of the day, he would call people up and talk to them about the events of the day. So you have this entire, um, you know, uh, record of uh, Nixon talking and sounding off about, you know, everything that happened during the day. Then in addition to that, uh, the, his chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, kept an audio diary every night. Um, their memoirs of the uh, former White House aides, practically everybody who was played an important role in Watergate, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of documents from the Nixon White House. So you end up with the richest repository of um, information that you can imagine for any president. And because no president is ever going to take themselves again, uh, we're never going to get as uh, close a uh, view of, you know, what's really going on in the White House as we do with Richard Nixon, even though this was never Nixon's intention. Um, Nixon, um, you know, regarded these recordings as his private property, which he intended to use for his memoirs, and uh, was horrified when the, the recordings started to be publicly released because he's completely indiscreet uh, in these conversations. So now this sort of wealth of documentation poses both a challenge, is both a blessing and a curse for biographers of Nixon, because, you know, if you're a biographer trying to describe all of Nixon's life from birth to death, 
uh, just you don't have the space to give the um, to go into detail about you know what was occurring day by day, minute by minute. So you lack the sort of intimacy that these tapes allow. So I, instead of choosing to write about all Nixon's life uh, or all of Watergate, I chose to focus on the most dramatic moments of all, which I think for reasons I'll try to explain, are the 100 days after his second inaugural uh, from January 20th, uh, 1973, when he seemed to be at the top of his game, uh, he still had a 67% approval rating at that time. He'd won re-election by one of the largest margins of the popular vote in American history, if not the largest margin. And uh, he'd largely put Watergate behind him. He was about to conclude a peace agreement in Vietnam. He had various foreign policy triumphs, including the opening to China, detente with Russia, and so on. So he really was feeling sort of pretty confident. And then within 100 days, it all falls apart. And uh, this very disciplined White House, uh, the aides start uh, fighting with each other. Um, Watergate, the cover-up um, of Watergate, the attempted cover-up, disintegrates, and everybody is running for cover. So they, the aides start, um, you know, trying to shift the blame onto each other. And finally, uh, they all start shifting the blame onto the president himself. So it's a very dramatic period, all of which is captured, or most of it is captured uh, on tape. So you can really, if you just focus on that period, I mean, I um, bring in other, you know, a lot of background, but the narrative of the story is about that 100 days. And it really allows me to do something that I don't think has been done before, which is to tell it, tell the story in a very intimate way. Um, now, um, I called it King Richard. Why did I call the book King Richard? Of course, King Richard is, uh, as an allusion to Shakespearean tragedy, King Lear. Um, I see Nixon as a tragic figure, uh, but he was called, another reason for the title is that um, his mother, who was a pious Quaker out in California, named all her boys after kings of England, and uh, including uh, Richard, um, who she named after the crusader king, uh, Richard the Lionheart. Um, so, you know, this title is very apt, I feel. So the book begins, uh, the opening scene is between, uh, is set in the Lincoln sitting room, as I said, Lincoln's, uh, Nixon's favorite room in the White House, on the second floor of the White House in the private quarters, uh, the smallest room in the White House, actually. Um, and Nixon would go up there every night to listen to music and to scribble on his yellow legal pads and to phone, you know, his cronies. Um, and uh, on the night of uh, January 20th, 1973, at one in the morning, among other things, he had trouble sleeping. He couldn't get to sleep. He called his aide, Chuck Colson, who was also known as his hatchet man, and talks about you know, the, um, his wish to get even with his enemies um, and uh, how he was going to wrap up the Vietnam War and also how he was going to get even with the Washington Post that was pursuing, my former newspaper that was pursuing this investigation into Watergate. So I'm going to play a little uh, extract from that um, tape. And so you can see how rich this, uh, material is. Um, now, he's just come back from the Kennedy Center. There's an inaugural day concert at the Kennedy Center. And uh, he's um, actually, they played 18, uh, Tchaikovsky's 1812 um, Overture. And there's uh, the pianist was Van Kleiber. So he's pumped up about that. And uh, he doesn't like the Washington Symphony Orchestra because for political reasons. He's brought a, uh, the Philadelphia 
Philharmonic down uh, to play for him. Uh, he considers them more politically aligned with him, particularly the conductor, Eugene Ormandy. Um, so I'm going to play a little bit of that. And then he goes on. And another extract is about his inaugural address that he's about to deliver. And he uh, shares portions of it with Chuck Colson. And then he talks about the Vietnam War. And then he talks finally about how he's going to stick it to the Washington Post. So I'm going to try to uh, share this uh, with you. Um, and uh, we'll... I'll, meet you on the other side here. Um, okay, so I think I'm sharing this with you. Um, Lincoln's sitting room, January 20th, 1973, President Nixon and Chuck Colson. Segment one. Don't you think the idea of having three concerts was great? Sticking it to Washington, having Armady, the great symphony, rather than that goddamn Washington symphony, even with Dorati, who's a great composer, you don't have them. And uh, God, Armady was fantastic. You know, uh, about uh, a dozen of his uh, people said uh, about the past to be relieved because of the bombing and the rest. He said, hell no, we'll uh, turn you out of the symphony. And, uh, and he said that decides to come back. I hope he does. I would want him to put his arm around me in front of these goddamn left wingers. Is that what I'm going to do? That's right. That's right. That's why I'm going to have the White House. Segment two. Well, I'm going to have the White House. Segment two. You want to hear a little uh, bit of the acceptance speech? Abroad and at home, the time has come to turn away from the condescending policies of paternalism. Segment three. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to end it there without uh, going um, into the last uh, thing, which was just uh, uh, attacking the Washington Post and expressing pleasure at um, uh, Colson's campaign to bring down the share price of the Washington Post. Um, but I think you get the flavor of it. Um, and you see that this allows um, you know, the writer and hopefully the reader to be flies on the wall to these very intimate conversations, very frank conversations, and go to places that we you know, are normally completely out of bounds to ordinary uh, mortals. Um, so um, now within 100 days of that conversation, Nixon's life had completely unraveled and his presidency had unraveled. And as I said, all his aides were fighting with each other. I mean, you heard there Chuck Colson, who was uh, you know, incredibly loyal to um, Nixon uh, and was really in charge of the dirty tricks. Um, he was the first to go. And then later on, uh, other aides, including Bob Haldeman, the chief of staff, John Ehrlichman, who was in charge of domestic policy, uh, they were, you know, forced to resign as kind of sacrificial uh, sa sacrifices to try to uh, push the blame of Watergate onto someone else. Um, so among other things, I'm interested in this group of people around Nixon and how they started fighting with each other and their different personalities. I mean, we can talk about this more later, but you have Colson, who was willing to do absolutely anything that Nixon even hinted at um, and believed that the president's orders should be carried out immediately without question. And you had somebody like the chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, who served as a buffer between Nixon and the rest of the White House. And Haldeman tried to, you know, restrain Nixon when he was, you know, in the mood to, uh, when he Nixon was, you know, doing things that Haldeman felt wouldn't be good for the country or wouldn't be good for the presidency. And then you have people like Henry Kissinger. I mean, Kissinger comes across in these tapes and in my book as the arch flatterer and psychophant. Um, he tells Nixon, you saved this country, Mr. President. The history books will show that that when no one will know what Watergate means. Excuse my bad German accent. Um, but uh, there's a rivalry between Nixon and Kissinger, actually, because one of the reasons that Nixon wanted to record his conversations was to show that he, Nixon, was the architect of all these foreign policy moves, not uh, Henry Kissinger. Um, so, but at the center of this story is the figure of Nixon himself, the 37th president, who I and many other uh, historians, biographers find endlessly fascinating. One of the reasons I wrote this book was that I had a conversation with a man called Stanley Cutler, who's written the, one of the classical um, books about Watergate, in which he goes into every you know, twist and turn in the scandal, um, most of which don't mean very much to modern day um, readers or listeners. But um, I called uh, Stanley Cutler up uh, as a reporter for the Washington Post and uh, I was surprised when he said to me that in 20 years, this is about 10 years ago before his uh, death, uh, nobody will know, nobody will um, uh, pay much attention to all the other people in the Watergate saga, but they will pay attention to Richard Nixon and Nixon will endure forever. You know, he's a, I structured this book as a kind of Shakespearean tragedy from hubris uh, in January of 1973, when he's about to be reinaugurated to the, you know, th through crisis, cath uh, catastrophe, and then in the end, um, the downfall of the president or setting the stage for the downfall of the president. Um, but as you'll see, um, 
there's an American twist at the end, which I'm not going to <laughs> reveal now, but you'll have to read the book. So it's not exactly a Shakespearean tragedy. It's, as I say, it's an American tragedy or drama um, that um, is different from a Shakespearean tragedy for one important reason. You're going to have to read the book for that. Um, so the other character in the book, very important, is not a human character. It's these tape recordings, um, which really kind of develop a life, a dynamic of their own, become a monster that Nixon cannot control and ultimately lead to his downfall. I don't think that Nixon would have been forced to resign had it not been for those tape recordings, because there would have been his version of events and there would have been the version of events of his accusers, particularly John Dean, his former legal counsel. And it would have been a he said, she said story. It was only because of the existence of the tapes, which Nixon was finally <clears throat> forced to release or the smoking gun tape to um, the on the orders of the Supreme Court that really uh, sealed Nixon's fate. Um, one of the reasons I see Nixon as a tragic figure, and of course one can argue about this, is that we can see his suffering and the pain that he felt as he, you know, gets involved in a situation from which he cannot extricate himself. And he, his, his entire career, he specialized in getting out of crises. But in Watergate, he finally met a crisis that he couldn't get out of. And uh, it was also very painful to him to part with people who had worked for him for many years, um, you know, particularly Bob Haldeman. And uh, Donald Trump went through four presidents in four years. Nixon had the, uh, f no, sorry, Donald Trump went through four chiefs of staff in four years. Uh, Nixon had the same man as his chief of staff throughout those four years and then found it extremely painful to uh, uh, demand Haldeman's resignation as a scapegoat for Watergate uh, in April of 1973. So I'm going to end before taking any questions just by playing you one little uh, extract of a conversation between Nixon and Haldeman after Nixon has announced Haldeman's resignation. Uh, and uh, it's so painful to him that Nixon starts drinking. And by the time he talks to Haldeman, he's quite already uh, has put back a few whiskeys. And so you can hear that in his voice, he talks about Haldeman as uh, you're going to hear my brother. I think this is a reference to Nixon's own brother, one of his brothers who died from tuberculosis when Nixon was a young man. Um, and, uh, you know, that, so when he's forced to part company with Haldeman, he's thinking of, you know, this tragedy that happened to him when he was a young man with, Actually, two of his brothers died of tuberculosis, but there was one in particular to whom he was very close. So um, I'm just going to share the screen again, and then we can talk on the other side of the this last little recording that I'm going to play for you. Um, Camp David, April 28th, 1973, yeah. President Nixon and John Earp. Sorry, that's the wrong one, just before that. Um. Lincoln sitting room, April 30th, 1973, President Nixon and Bob Haldeman.
we've had a no 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 they know they know they know who to go you know they know they can get through but in any event I just want you to know that Cap called and he was all the way but let me say you're a strong man god damn it and I love you <laughs> and I you know I love John we're all the rest and by God keep the faith keep the faith you're gonna win this son of a bitch absolutely you notice what I said about the violence and so forth on the other side yeah. I mean there were there some there were some intricacy in this with only this stuff to go and understand I, I got those and I want to get the text because there's some things to work on from there but alright but uh, see, so I thought it was good to do to, to sort of end on what I deeply felt you know the religious note you know yeah. God bless America I mean I don't I'm sure must have been, you know, driven you up the wall. Didn't drive me up the wall, but I felt that way. Well, I know that I'm all for that. Great. I don't know whether you can call and get any reactions and call me back. Or, you know, like, do you want to Would you mind? I don't think I can. I don't. I no, I agree. I don't. Know, but don't, I'm trying to do don't call a goddamn soul. The hell with it. Let me just say. Getting this call from me, from you, from any cabinet officer except Weinberger uh, an hour afterwards. And thank God, and no staff member. Well, now when I so, told them, the board said they were instructed not to put any calls through. So, the hell with that. I told them they put all the calls through. Well, that may be why you haven't gotten them, though, because that's the stuff all right. you told me. Okay, so that was uh, the end of this 30-day period. I actually go a little beyond that, um, but um, this is the main arc of the narrative. So if there are any questions, I'd love to um, respond, um, but thank you for uh, bearing with me. I hope you could all hear the um, those little uh, audio extracts without any trouble. Um, happy, to, to, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Michael. Um, we do have questions, but first and foremost, can you talk to me a little bit about how you accessed these tapes and how, about how many hours of tape there are? Well, there are a total of 3,700 hours, only a small fraction of which were released uh, back um, uh, while Nixon was still president on the orders of the Supreme Court. And so most of the standard Nixon um uh, Watergate books do not include this 3,700 hours or most of the 3,700 hours of tapes, which were only released in the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, so they're actually all up on the Nixon Library website. Um, it takes a bit of navigating, but anybody can go and listen to them. Um, and you can also uh, listen to some of the extracts on my website uh, at least the tapes, some of the tapes that I use in the book, michaeldobbsbooks.com. Uh, if you go there, you'll find some of the tapes that I've uh, quoted from, including the ones that uh, I've just played this evening. Thank you. Um, why do you think we're still fascinated with the 37th president? Well, uh, partly it's uh, the important nature of his presidency. I mean, I think this was a turning point from, for America at the end of the 60s. Um, you know, it was the culmination of the Vietnam War, um, important moves in foreign policy, including the opening to China, which, you know, we're living with the implications of that now. But mainly it's, you know, Nixon's own personality, this man who you know, really brought himself up from nothing. I mean, he was born to a dirt poor Quaker family out in California. Um, he's often compared to Trump, but, you know, Trump was born on third base. Nixon was uh, had to, everything he achieved, uh, he did through his own efforts, and then he threw it away because of the flaws in his um, character. Um particularly his sort of paranoia and his d mistrust of, you know, his determination to fight for everything he he achieved, you know, that sort of became his also his fatal flaw, uh, determination to get even with his enemies and so on. 
Um, but he's a contradictory character. You know, he's a man of great talents, uh, great vision. Uh, he worked extremely hard. Um, I mean, I say that he's like, uh, you know, he's a kind of ordinary American, but only more so. You know, he has all the all the virtues and all the the flaws of the average American. He sort of worked harder than anybody else. He hated people with greater intensity than anybody else. Um, so he just took everything to an extreme. Um, and, um, you know, that's, a, for me at least, is a fascinating character study. Carol is interested in the makeup of the Supreme Court at the time, and if Nixon had any vision of this ever ending up at the Supreme Court? Well, he chose to keep the tapes, and actually I end the book with this scene. Actually, this is in uh, uh, July, August of uh, 1973, after the um, one of his aides, Alexander Butterfield, has revealed uh, that the president has been taping himself. And um, so then Nixon, when he hears about this, he's actually in hospital uh, suffering from pneumonia in the same naval hospital, uh, actually where I live in just outside Washington in Bethesda, the same hospital that uh, President Trump was taken to with uh, COVID a few months ago. And Nixon is there and he's feeling, um, you know, terrible. So his mind is a bit kind of clouded. Um, because he's on, you know, heavy painkillers and so on. Um, and um, he uh, has to take a decision on what many of his aides are urging him to have a bonfire on the White House lawn and destroy the tapes. But he still thinks he can control the tapes and the tapes will be his ally uh, in this fight with John Dean and others that he will be able to release selective portions of the conversations um, without that will bolster his version of events. I mean, it's a terrible miscalculation. Obviously, we know that now. But at the time, it seemed logical to uh, Nixon. Uh, as for the Supreme Court, it was um, uh, actually the, um, the uh, there were probably equal numbers of liberal and conservative justices on the Supreme Court. But when it came to this question of whether the tapes should be released, uh, there was a unanimous decision among all the justices, including the conservative ones, to uh, release, uh, to order Nixon to release those tapes that would shed light on whether crimes had been committed in the White House. Did the Supreme Court require transcripts of those tapes or did they require making those tapes publicly accessible? Yeah, I mean, there's, well, there's a long sort of argument over how exactly uh, he would release the tapes. And, you know, that is a kind of, I don't deal with this in the book myself, but this is kind of what happens afterwards. It becomes a legal political argument from being a personal psychodrama that I describe in the book. Um, so initially Nixon says, well, I won't release the tapes. I will release, uh, transcripts. And, um, you know, so he released very, um, uh, sort of doctor, doctored transcripts. I mean, people of uh, my age will remember, you know, he released these transcripts with, uh, every other sentence was expletive deleted. Um, and so it was suspected that he wasn't really releasing, you know, all the, incriminating stuff on the tape. So finally, the Supreme Court said, no, you transcripts aren't good enough. You have to actually release the tapes themselves. You talk about Nixon in the very beginning of your book and hubris. Um, yeah. Can you expound a little bit about that hubris and that Nixon has? Yeah, actually, I quote um, Chuck Colson, the man you heard at the beginning, says that hubris became the mark of the Nixon man because hubris was the quality that Nixon admired most. Hubris is a Greek word from hubris, which means excessive pride, presumption, or arrogance. And in uh, Greek tragedy, um, you know, the, uh, the hero is always brought down by his sort of arrogance or pride. And um, 
So I think this, you know, pretty much sums up Nixon in January of 1973, that um, everything is going right for him. And uh, he's kind of coasting after his re-election. Um, he thinks he's, you know, can stick it to his enemies. Uh, he uses more colorful language than this often, <laughs> um, but I'm toning it down here. He thinks he will stick it to his enemies. And, um, uh, you know, so he uh, he's really setting himself up for the fall later. But um, um, that's what hubris means. And there's plenty of evidence of it in those early scenes that I describe in my book. Um, Michael, it's been said that Mr. Nixon had the language of a drunken sailor. Um, <laughs> and certainly sometimes he had very objectionable language and tone. Are there conversations and with whom do you find as a reporter that some of these um, were most surprising? I mean, which ones? Yeah. Were, he, he was horribly bad about swearing and right. who do you what do you find most surprising as a reporter well there are a lot of sort of anti-semitic generally racist remarks that uh, he indulges in of course you know he wasn't doing this in public I and mean, these are private tapes it's not like trump's tweets these are private uh, that he never intended to them to be made public and probably you know to be fair to him if um we were tape recorded or many of us, you know, we would say things that are embarrassing that we wouldn't want the uh, general public, let alone everybody in the world to listen in to our private conversations. So you've got to cut him some slack for that. I mean, but there's also, he did swear, I think, more than the average person. Um, and um, he has got this very colorful turn of phrase. And um you know, they all, I mean, one of the things you see is that even someone like Kissinger, who's com from a completely different background, a German Jew, um, is trying to, they're all, all the aides are trying to compete with each other to swear uh, as uh, like Nixon. Um, so partly you ask what surprised me. I mean, it's, I guess it's this dynamic of all the people, all the, AIDS, you know, it's rather like a royal court in which all the courtiers are trying to compete against each other for the, um, for the, um, uh, to gain the attention and the, um, and the benevolence of the king. Um, so there's a very interesting internal dynamic that is going on that I tried to describe. So let's speak a little bit about that competition among the AIDS. What then uh, really prompts the the defection, I suppose, yeah. of the AIDS? And right. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, um, this uh, it really starts unraveling when the burglars who broke into the Watergate back in 1972 um, they're caught red-handed and they're put on trial, and the administration tries to cut off responsibility at the level of the burglars and their immediate boss, uh, Gordon Liddy. Um, and so they're put on trial, and the trial actually starts at the same time that um, uh, uh, I begin the narrative. Um, and a man called Jeb Magruder, who's the head of the uh, committee to re-elect the president, he has, goes uh, before the judge and commits perjury. Uh, they say the uh, prosecutor asked Magruder if he gave any instructions for the break in of the Watergate or the taping of Democratic National uh, Committee. And Magruder, who's this young, sort of cherubic looking, sort of very ambitious, um, uh, you know, aide in his 30s, he says, no, it's nothing to do with him and that uh, Gordon Liddy was acting without any authorization at all. And uh, in fact, Magruder himself has authorized uh, the break-in. Um, but one of the burglars, a man called James McCord, listens to this and he thinks, you know, why should I and the rest of us take responsibility for this when we know that, you know, the real... Um, the people who gave the orders, including uh, Jeb Magruder, are, you know, got getting off scot-free 
And while we're being about to be sent, all sent to this horrible jail, the Washington DC jail. Um, so McCord decides that he's not going to put up with this and writes a letter to the judge. Um, and, um, you know, that's really when the whole uh, cover-up starts unraveling because Nixon, uh, McCord says that perjury has been committed in the trial. Um, the president's legal counsel, John Dean, uh, realizes that the White House is being blackmailed. He's afraid that he can be implicated. He will be sent to prison. He's not about to be, he's not willing to be sent to prison for uh, the crimes as he sees it of other people. Um, so he turns on Nixon, uh, or he, first of all, he turns on Magruder and tries to get Magruder to shoulder responsibility. So there's kind of this infighting between Magruder and Dean. Um, as Nixon puts it, um, he, his aides are pissing on each other, and then they start pissing on the president um, to be crude about it, which is what Nixon was. Um, so, um, you know, once the taboo has been broken that um, uh, there's just one person, James McCord, is not willing to go along with this, um, with the cover-up and starts blowing, on the whistle, blowing the whistle on it, then this whole sort of house of cards begins to fall apart. Aren't they mostly attorneys and lawyers? I mean, I, from yeah. my memory, it seems that, that Nixon was a, quite the law student and several of the aides were law students. Did that's, they not? Right. Well, that's one of the points that um, John Dean makes, actually. Um, he uh, at one point writes up a list of the everybody who's involved in the White House, in the Watergate, either in the White House or the committee to re-elect the president, and he puts asterisks against all of the lawyers, and most of them are lawyers, including Nixon himself. Of course, you know the whole um, uh, legal uh, question of uh, obstruction of justice and conspiracy is a specialized branch of the law, so they weren't necessarily criminal lawyers. But um, so some of them were smarter than others of realizing the legal jeopardy they were in. I'd say that Dean was the smartest in that respect. He realized that he could be sent to prison for many years. And that was one reason why he blew the whistle on the whole conspiracy. But um, yeah, they uh, were lawyers. They should have known better. But as Nixon says at one point, if the president does it, then that means it's legal. So he thinks that if the president orders a break-in, he can claim that he's justified for national security reasons. And this was the, you know, the whole political legal dispute of Watergate that um, you know, in the end they decided just because the president orders it doesn't mean it's legal at all. It became a constitutional crisis precisely for that reason. Carol wants to know about his enemies and who was Nixon out to get? Well, he was out to get anybody who, uh, I mean, there's a long list of enemies, uh, beginning with the Kennedys, because if you recall, Nixon had lost a, an election to Jack Kennedy in 1960. And here there's a modern day echo uh, if we think about the events of the past few months, that um, actually in the 1960 election, it was extremely close, much closer than the last election. Uh, and um, uh, it was determined by a few thousand votes in Illinois and Texas, including disputed votes in Cook County that were controlled by Mayor Daley of Chicago. So Nixon had a much more legitimate basis for challenging the results of the election than certainly Donald Trump did, in my view, in the last election. But um, he did not challenge the results of the election. Um, he decided that, you know, for the good of the country, he uh, would accept the results of the election, but he bore 
a lasting grudge against the Kennedys, and he was determined that he would never uh, again allow himself to be cheated. So this explains, in part, his thirst for political intelligence. And when it came to the 1972 election, he was, you know, determined not to be, as he's, I'm, I'm just describing what's going on in his mind, he's determined you know, not to allow the Kennedys to cheat him of an election again, or not, it wasn't so much the Kennedys, but it was the Democrats. Um, and that was one of the, that thirst for political intelligence is one of the sources of Watergate. But as far as the enemies are concerned, you know, they range from the Kennedys to um, uh, the, uh, to um, journalists, to the entire you know, Eastern foreign policy establishment, the elites in general, um, you know, he drew up a long enemies list. Um, and, you know, there's some quite humorous uh, enemies. I and mean, for example, he had a dispute with the Dean of the Washington Cathedral. LBJ dies in the middle of all this, and they're deciding whether to bury or to have a memorial service for President Johnson in the National Cathedral in Washington, but Nixon um, is enemy. One of his enemies is the dean of the cathedral, who's a big leader of the anti-war movement. So Nixon goes off in a on a tirade against the dean of the cathedral and says he's not going to allow any funeral to take place in the cathedral, and if it does, he's not going to attend, and so on and so forth. Um, so all this, you get a kind of insight into. Uh, you know, the depth of his hatred of uh, the other side, which is very revealing. Kathy wants to know about the environment in the newsroom at the Post during that time period. Um, what yeah. do you know about that? Right. Well, I started working for the Post after this period, but I do know some of the actors involved, including Bob Woodward and, and uh, Carl Bernstein. Of course, you know, it was a, for journalists, like those two, they were very young reporters at the time. This was, uh, you know, the kind of story that, that perhaps they dreamt of. And uh, the Post was under great pressure from the administration. Um, it was just begun going public. Um, so there was pressure on the proprietor, uh, Catherine Graham, uh, to, turn, to restrain um, the reporters, but she sided with the reporters. So it was, you know, the Post was breaking all this news and it was extremely exciting. And then you had a whole generation of reporters for good and ill that wanted to model themselves on Bernstein and Woodward. I mean, that's another story, but it was really, you know, I mean, I guess a lot of uh, cub reporters like myself went into journalism in part because of, you know, the whole story of uh, Woodward and Bernstein and, and Watergate. I hate to take you back to the tapes, but I want to ask, there's this tremendous amount of tapes, and you focused on these these months, these periods um, that you said were the most um, critical, yeah. passionate, the most, the most critical, perhaps. Um, did you listen to them all? And <laughs> no, I didn't listen to them all, but I listened to the key ones. I mean, some of them are... Uh, it depends. Some of the tapes are better quality than others. I mean, those that I just played are, uh, were recorded on the telephone, so they're fairly easy to uh, understand. And there's some tapes that are, you know, pretty much impossible. And the professional archivists whose job it was to listen to all the tapes and make transcripts of some of them, they calculated that you needed to listen for 100 hours in order to get one hour of transcript. So if you multiply that by the by 3,700 hours of tapes, you can see that it would take several lifetimes uh, for somebody to listen to all the tapes and uh, decipher them all. And there are parts it's of it that are, you know, completely unintelligible. So I have to confess that I didn't listen to them all. <laughs> Aren't there portions that are missing? There's something very famous yeah. about these missing yeah. minutes. In the well, the yeah, there's a famous missing 17 minutes, which probably this is one of the first tapes after the uh, Watergate break-in. 
um, when Nixon is talking to his aides. So obviously there's conversations about Watergate in it. I don't, I mean, so there's been a lot of conspiracy theories about what was, what's in those missing 17 minutes. Uh, do, uh, you know, does it actually reveal that Nixon ordered the break-in at the Watergate? I don't think it does because you have to sort of triangulate with other sources of information, including the Haldeman diaries. So we know pretty much which was what was in those 17 minutes. I think it's just Nixon being ham-fisted and he tried to, so he started listening to these tapes. He started pressing all these buttons on his tape recorder. He probably wanted to um, get rid of um, some bits that were, uh, uh, you know, compromising to him. Um, but actually, they're not any more compromising than a whole lot of other things on the tapes. I mean, that's what most historians, including me, believe. Um, but, you know, you can argue about that. Michael, what do you think we've learned from all of this? Well, um, I mean, Nixon, he kept on saying, well, you shouldn't, um, the, the problem wasn't the original crime, it was the cover-up. And um, he had experience himself of, uh, of, uh, of uh, unraveling a cover-up with the affair of Alger Hiss when he was a young congressman. So he, uh, you know, it shows um, that uh, whatever else you do, don't cover it up because the cover-up in Watergate became worse than the original crime. He could have, you know, blamed Watergate on various subordinates and underlings, but covering up it up, i.e. obstruction of justice, was what really brought him down. But on a larger level, I'd say, you know, it's a kind of, at least my book is an insight into this very introverted world. It's a kind of royal court, American version of a royal court. And all, there are all these courtiers around the president. And the president in that White House becomes extremely isolated. You know, it, it's a kind of echo chamber in which everybody is telling the president what he want, what they think he wants to hear. And that's a dangerous situation, not just for Nixon, but for all presidents, that uh, after a bit, they become isolated, um, uh, you know, uh, distant from reality. And this is particularly a problem of, you know, the second term. I mean, the first term, they're more sort of rooted in reality. And then you know, anybody who's living in that very sort of pressurized fishbowl type of environment, um, you have to be a very sane person to, you know, remain grounded in, you know, common sense and some degree of uh, humility. You need somebody to, I mean, people say traditionally, this is what the spouses do, you know, they, and the family does, they keep them keep the president sort of grounded, but it's a disease of any president and some presidents suffer from it more than others. Thank you for your discussion this evening and for doing the research um, and for appearing tonight via Zoom. We greatly appreciate it. I would encourage people to pick up this book, um, King Richard. It was available at Amazon and most bookstores now, as I understand. And I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy the book. Well, thank you very much. It's been great to be with you. And uh, I hope you are encouraged to go out and buy the book, or at least borrow it from the library. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And I wish all of you a good evening. Thank you for joining us. Good night.